the books that are on the subject of prayer, we see that there are some real tensions on the subject. Listen to these titles and how they contrast each other. Where is the Lord? Of Elijah in prayer. You can never walk alone. Getting things from God versus how can God answer prayer. Let's pray together versus the hidden life of prayer. Prayer without pretending. Saying better prayers. The Holy Spirit, our teacher in prayer versus teach yourself to pray. Beyond the natural order versus five laws that govern prayer. Taking hold of God versus prayer. Conversing with God. Let go and let God versus God's sovereignty and the free will of man in prayer. Does prayer really change things? Well, in the midst of uh, all of these uh, confusing perspectives on prayer, we're looking at James chapter 5, verses 13 through 20, and seeking to understand what James, at least, has to say about prayer. And his main point is, that the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous person will accomplish much. Does prayer really change things? James says yes. We don't want to be so theologically uh, correct in the sense of the sovereignty of God and the providence of God and the decrees of God that we don't obey God's word. We are told to pray, and therefore we ought to pray. And we are told that the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous person will accomplish much. And so we need to pray diligently. In James chapter 5, verse 13, he's given us some different situations in which we should pray or in which we should offer praise. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And we mentioned that last time that what was most important here was the fact that we understand that it is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the name that brings answer to prayer. The anointing with oil could be simply the cultural practice in that day, of rubbing a person with oil, people who were very sick, who would be uh, dehydrating, people who were very sick with high temperatures, people who were very sick and in the heat of the day to rub them, to massage them, and to provide oil was to care for them physically. But we need to care for them spiritually too. Verse 15 goes on, And the prayer offered in faith. And this is so very important. We need to pray believing. We need to pray trusting. We need to pray diligently. We need to pray in faith. Remember we saw in James chapter 1 that the person who doubts with God, the person who disputes God, is not going to have their prayer answered. And so the prayer needs to be offered in faith. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and I understand this as physical sickness rather than spiritual sickness. And the Lord will raise him up, raise him up from that bed of affliction, from that bed of sickness. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Now, those that argue that this passage refers to a spiritual sickness certainly focus on this aspect of the forgiveness of sins. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Well, if, he, if it is spiritual uh, sickness that is talking about here, then he has or she has committed sins. There's no if about it. The if may be the suggestion that some sickness and some problems that we face are a result of sin. We cannot suggest that all sickness is the result of personal sin. Certainly, all sickness is a result of uh, Adam's sin, of creation sin, the original sin. That brought sin and death and disease to all of us. And so there is an aspect where the root cause of all sin and or all disease and death is sin, but not personal sin, as if the someone personally has done something, and therefore God is punishing them with sickness. We do know that uh, bad behavior, sinful behavior, does bring on sickness. We can look at alcoholism, certainly see the consequences of that. We can look at drugs 
and we can certainly see the abuse of drugs has its consequences. We can look at things like overeating, and certainly we see the consequences. But we can also look at things like anger. Anger uh, ruins our metabolic state, and uh, when we become angry and bitter, our bodies begin to pour all kinds of terrible uh, enzymes and and chemicals and other things. I'm not a medical doctor, but I've read about it. And the stress that can bring uh, a change in our physical health and physical well-being. Well, if we have committed sins, they will be forgiven. With our acknowledgement of our physical sickness, we need to acknowledge also our spiritual weakness at times. Now, we do see in the Bible, in Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians 11, when he speaks about the Lord's table and the Lord's supper, that God had caused some there to be sick. Others he even caused to die. Why? Because they were abusing the Lord's table, the Lord's celebration, the communion time. They had turned it into a wild party. They had turned it into a festival instead of a time of worship. And so God did judge some of those with illness and some of them even with death because of their sinful, sinful behavior. But not all illness is as a result of sin. You remember the Apostle Paul. He had some kind of thorn in his flesh. That thorn in the flesh was sent, allowed by God, but sent and caused by Satan. And that thorn in the flesh was something that he prayed over many times for it to be removed, and yet God chose not to because in Paul's weakness, then God could use him in a great way. Sin was not, personal sin was not the cause of Paul's thorn in the flesh. It was something that God allowed. We also see for Timothy that Timothy apparently had some problems with his stomach, and Paul told him to take a little wine for your stomach's sake as a medicinal or medical uh, benefit to him. There's no apparent uh, statement that it was because of Timothy's sin. Otherwise, Paul would have said to him, stop doing this (laughs) and uh, you'll feel better. No, uh, sin can cause us physical ailment, but not all physical ailment is the result of personal sin. And so the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, then they will be forgiven him. Verse 16, therefore, he says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. When we confess or acknowledge our sins to one another, This is not so that we can forgive each other. This isn't like confessing to a priest. Um, We can go boldly unto the throne of grace to obtain mercy and help in time of need. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We don't have to go through any earthly person. In fact, I think the Bible even forbids that. We go directly to Jesus Christ. But acknowledgement of sins to one another is for the purpose of praying for one another, not to provide forgiveness for one another. No person on earth can provide forgiveness to us. They cannot cleanse our sins. It is Jesus Christ, the mediator between God and man, who provides that forgiveness of sin. And if somebody's telling you that you have to go to confession to a human being, in order to find forgiveness, then you better read your Bible. That is not what this passage is teaching. When it says confess your sins to one another, it is for the purpose of praying for one another. It is an accountability to one another. And this is a very healthy, healthy relationship. We need to have an accountability with each other. We need to hold each other spiritually encouraging and accountable so that we can grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as it says, the effective prayer of a righteous person can accomplish much. In verse 17 and 18, he gives us an example. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He was just like ours. You remember the story of Elijah? Oh, how weak he was at times, but how greatly God used him. 
And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it did not rain on earth for three years and six months. If you want to read this Old Testament story, go to 1 Kings 17 and 18. Elijah was no great uh, pillar of faith. He was weak as we are, and yet God answered his prayers. Verse 18, and he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Yes, God will do great and mighty things if we pray. But in verses 19 and 20, we see that we need to care for each other and watch over each other so that we can encourage and build each other up. He says, my brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death, I think both physical death and spiritual death, and will cover a multitude of sins. Yes, if we can turn each other, encourage each other, turn each other away from the way of sin and error, and to the truth and the righteousness of God's word, then we will cover a multitude of sins. Why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from cleanses us from all sin. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that brings us back from the error of our way. So let us uh, be people who are diligent in prayer righteous in prayer, that we might be effective in prayer. When misfortune knocks you down, be sure that you fall into the hands of God. To fail to publicly praise God is to rob him of glory when he has brought blessings to us. So let us, when we are cheerful, sing praises to the Lord. When we are sick or suffering, let us call the elders and let them aid us in praying. Sin will bring sickness and even death to the believer. We should deny our pride, confess our sins, and confess our need of strength and power from God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, prayer, to be effective, must come from a righteous or repentant life. We are responsible as members of the body of Christ to encourage, to build up, and to pray for each other. So let's not criticize each other. Let's not judge each other when we're down. But let us put our arms around each other and lift each other up. Quietly today, meditate for a moment with the Lord. If you are experiencing misfortune, ask God to help you. If you are cheerful, break out in a song of praise. If you are sick or suffering, call the elders to pray with you and pray over you. Confess your sins that God may heal and forgive you so that your prayers will be effectual prayers, will be righteous prayers on behalf of others. Yes, there's many approaches to prayer, but all approaches should go to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we do that, the Holy Spirit will intercede on our behalf with other utterances and groans before the throne that are too deep for us to speak. When we do not know how to pray, then let's go to the Holy Spirit and have him pray on our behalf and guide and direct us. Because if we're going to have powerful prayer, then we need to be in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If we're going to do God's will, we need to know God's word. And we need to rightly divide the word of truth. And the word of truth tells us to pray in the name of Jesus Christ. So let's this day and forevermore go to God in those times of need, in those times of praise, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and let us offer up these words of praise that by knowing God's word, we will do God's will. <laughs> 